Welcome everybody um, to this fifth Art History and Visual Studies uh, webinar. My name is Marcus Melwright, uh, Chair of the Department, and I'm delighted uh, to be able to uh, introduce uh, this discussion sponsored by uh, the Orion Series in Fine Arts. Um, you'll find previous uh, webinars in this series on the Fine Arts uh, YouTube channel. Uh, today's discussion is entitled Unmasking Meaning, Culture, Collection and Family. And this will be a discussion between Monica Zesnick, our Orion guest speaker and curator of North American collections at the Ethnologische Museum in Berlin, and Carrie Newman, uh, the Impact Chair in Indigenous Art Practices in the Departments of Visual Arts and Art History and Visual Studies. And this discussion is going to be moderated by Kim Dillon of uh, the Department of Visual Arts. So, I'll, I'll just give you a quick um, idea about the format of this. So um, after the introductions, uh, Carrie uh, will be providing a land acknowledgement, um, and then it'll move into a discussion uh, between Monica and Carrie, which will be um, moderated by Kim. At around about 12.30, depending on how the discussion goes, um, it'll move into a Q&A uh, session. Uh, and this is an opportunity for you to ask questions uh, of uh, the discussants. Um, and you can do that uh, using the Q&A button, which you'll find uh, at the bottom of your screen. So it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, the Dean of Fine Arts, uh, Alana Lindgren, who will be offering some uh, further words. Great, great. Thank you very much, Marcus. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Kim Dillon, our moderator today. Dr. Dillon is a sessional instructor in critical theory and curating in the Department of Visual Arts. She received her PhD from the Royal College of Art, London, in critical and historical studies, and her MA in curating from Goldsmiths, University of London. Dr. Dillon also holds a BA in English with a specialty in cultural studies and art history from McGill University. Her research and teaching areas are in contemporary art history and criticism, conceptual art, intersectional feminist theory, art and language, artist books, and diaspora and mixed race studies. For 15 years, she worked on international curatorial projects, commissions, and art exhibitions in London, Sarajevo, and Guangzhou, with leading international artists and specializing in site-specific and public art commissions. Her first book is in process and explores written language and power in contemporary art. Dr. Dillon is also an award-winning writer of creative nonfiction, art criticism and poetry, and publishes internationally in titles including Freeze, Room, ID, C Magazine, and Border Crossings, as well as academic journals. Finally, Dr. Dillon enjoys working with students engaged with and interested in bringing critical theory into their studio practices. She also convenes a writing group for the graduate students in the Department of Visual Arts. It's my pleasure, as I said, to hand the microphone over to Dr. Dillon. Goodness, thank you, Alana. Uh, that was a very generous <laughs> introduction to myself. So uh, I won't add anything further to that. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you all for joining us uh, for this conversation, Unmasking Meaning, Culture, Collection and Family. Um, thank you to everyone who is with us in the Pacific time zone and also especially to Monica who is joining us from the evening um, east of Greenwich Mean Time. So um, just to recap what Marcus has already outlined, we'll have um, introductions. I'll let both of the speakers introduce themselves as well as the object that we'll be discussing today. And then we'll have a moderated conversation between our two speakers for about 60 to 70 minutes, at which point we'll turn it over to um, questions from yourself, the audience. Um, and I suppose just as a, as a note uh, before we begin the discussion that we are dealing with um, culturally sensitive material. And so just to bear that in mind as we go through. And um, I believe that's everything by way of introduction. So um, I, I have nothing further to say about myself other than my pronouns are she, her, and I'm delighted to be here today. Um, so Carrie, I will turn it over to you um, to introduce yourself first, if you'd be so kind. Thank you, Kim. Your 
Nuguam Kerry Newman, Heyman Bakwam Klai Hail Kingame. Through my father, I'm Kukwakiwak from the Kukwekum, Dick Sam, or Wawalabai clans of Northern Vancouver Island, and Coast Salish from Chiam of the Stalo Nation along the Upper Fraser Valley. Through my mother, my ancestors are settlers of English, Irish, and Scottish heritage. I want to begin by acknowledging all of my family who are with us watching um, and to say that each of them have connections to this mask that, um, that we see in front of us now. Uh, and I especially want to extend my gratitude to uh, my chief, Wed Liddy Speck, for his generosity and always helping me to better understand our culture and family history. Uh, finally, I want to offer a land acknowledgement. So we here, um, Kim and I, and, and everybody at UVic are coming from across Lekwungen and Wasanich territories. Um, and being that we're talking about history, culture, and the process of decolonization, um, I just wanted to put into the minds and hearts of everybody who is listening and watching to, to take what you hear from this conversation and apply it in your life, in your work, in your institution. Um, because decolonization is a process. Um, and for us to be to become fully decolonized, uh, we really have to start thinking things differently. We have to start imagining different structures. It's not enough to, to rearrange things. It's not enough to, uh, to bring in a couple of additional uh, people of different representational groups. We actually have to look at the processes um, that we engage in and, and see how we can make them more fair, more equal. Um, so, so that's what I ask of this moment, this acknowledgement, um, is that we can't just think about these things, we have to actually turn them into action. Um, Gila Kesla, thank you everyone for coming and I'm gonna pass it back to you, Kim. Thank you, Carrie. And I'll come back to you as well um, to introduce a mask in just a moment. Uh, and so I'd like to have our second speaker introduce themselves. Uh, we have also Monica Zesnick joining us from Berlin. Monica? Good morning. It's a great pleasure for me to be invited to this Orion lecture and that you have me. First, I would like to thank Carrie for inviting me to this talk. It's an honor for me to talk with him about the mask and ancestors of his family. And I hope I can give a little insight into what has happened to the mask since it left British Columbia in 1882. I also want to thank the Dean, Elena Lindgren and Marcus Will Milwright as the department chair for art history and visual studies. And thank you also Kim Dillon for moderating our discussion. And last but not least, I want to thank you all as the audience for being here today. My name is Monika Zesnik. I'm Austrian from origin, but I have been working on uh, working and living on and off for about 30 years in Germany, most time in Berlin, also sometime in Mexico. And I, in the moment I'm working as the curator for the North American collection in the Ethnological Museum Berlin. I say the uh, English title because Ethnologisches Museum is always hard to understand for, for non-German speakers. Prior to this position, I was the responsible curator of education in our museum and for the Asian Art Museum. And furthermore, I was able to gain work experience in communication and interdisciplinary event curation of different international acting cultural institutions, like the Berlin House of World Cultures or the Bear American Institute here. In the recent years, I have been working on different projects, amongst others with the Haida-Gwai Museum and the Haida Nation Council, and as well as the Chuga Heritage Foundation in Alaska. I will refer to these projects later. Let me tell you just a few words about the institutional background I'm working in, because that's also important to understand how I can act as a curator. 
the Ethnological Museum, which is part of a huge foundation, the uh, Russian Cultural Heritage Foundation, was the museum was founded in 1873. So we are quite an old institution. Besides research institutions and library, 19 museums belong to our foundation. We have about 2,000 employees, uh, so that makes us a big institution, but sometimes also a heavy tanker when it comes to changes. Our foundation is funded by the German federal government and all 16 of Germany's provinces. And they all form the board of the foundation and they're also responsible to decide questions, for instance, of ownership or restitution. The majority of the collection stored in our museum came to Berlin between 1870 and 1914, at the heydays of European expansion and colonialism. During this period, most of the nearly 30,000 objects in the North American collection were acquired or appropriated from collectors and traders or through exchanges with the North American museums. The slide you are seeing here um, is referring to our new exhibition space. Our museum's current exhibition are presented in the Humboldt Forum, which is in the center of Berlin since September last year. Further exhibition will open in the fall this year, including the uh, shows showing the American collections. The research resources, storages, archives, the library will stay in the building in the outskirts of Berlin, which also served as our exhibition space for nearly 50 years till 2017. Let me just say at the end of the introduction, a few words to the Humboldt Forum, because that's also important to understand our work. The space where the Humboldt Forum was built is the former location of the historic Royal Berlin Palace. You see on the left-hand side, a photo of the destroyed palace. It was severely damaged in World War II and demolished in 1950 under the government of the German Democratic Republic, meaning East Germany. Um, in the German Democratic Republic, they decided to build the so-called Palace of Republic, that's the picture in the middle, as a cultural and political center. After the fall of Berlin Wall and the reunion of East and West Germany, the building was closed and later on torn down too. Both of it had been political decisions. The uh, socialistic government didn't want to have a sign of colonialism in the center of the city. And well, the reunited German, Germany didn't want to have a symbol of socialism in the middle of the city. So the federal government of Germany passed a resolution in 2000 to reconstruct the former city palace. And this reconstruction is now home of the Humboldt Forum. The Humboldt Forum is a multidisciplinary venue, means there are not only exhibition, there are also a lot of venue for events, and there's a, pre a presentation of the Humboldt University. But the Humboldt Forum is also the cause of controversial, controversial debates. The ongoing public discussion shows that the interests are very heterogeneous. A noteworthy number of civil initiatives embedded in the post-colonial discourses has, understandable, a highly critical approach to the reconstruction of a building representing colonial powers, as well as to the contents, the anthropological collection. Most of the critiques refer to the collection gained under the authority of German colonial powers, as from Namibia, Tanzania, regions in the Pacific, like parts of Papua New, Papua New Guinea or Samoa. So that would be the background I'm working in, and that would also be the surroundings where the mask will be exhibited from this fall on. So I would give back to Kim then. Thank you, Monica, for that excellent introduction. Um, I'm so excited to see where this conversation goes. Um, we have one more introduction, uh, which Carrie, I'll ask you to make, and that's the mask in question, which we're perhaps, you know, I'm also thinking already about what you said in your introduction and your land acknowledgement, um, how we're not only speaking about it, but maybe perhaps speaking to it in this conversation. So if you'd like to introduce the mask so that the audience can also have um, um, a kind of understanding or an image of that in their mind, and then we can move forward into the conversation. Certainly, thank you, Kim. Um, and thank you, Monica. Um, so this is the new release mask, um, and the history uh, I have here that was um, provided by by Wedledy, who I was who I mentioned earlier, um, is as follows. 
The ancestor of the Kukwekum came down at Wakanuk, a place in Tribune Channel in Night Inlet. His name was Kwakwastala. Kwakwastala, Kwakwakstala joined the Kwagul at Kalaguis when the Kwak when the Kwakwakwak was for, was forming tribes. A descendant of Kwakwakstala named Nulis Wakadzi vanquished a Sisyuth that prevented his Namima from access to their ancestral home. The Nulis mask is shown by the Kukwekum of the Kumoye during winter ceremonies. And so the mask of Nulis is also known as the elder brother of the tribes. In my uh, introduction, I, I said that I was from the Kukwekum, Gixam, and Wawalabai. And so this mask represents that branch of my Kukwakiwak family, um, the Kukwekum uh, clan. Um, there are three generations of this mask. There's this one in, uh, in Berlin. There's one at the Museum of Anthropology at UBC. And the most recent one is in our family's box of treasures. Uh, so I welcome um, this mask into this conversation, Gila Kessler. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah. Okay, and there is one, we'll, uh, we'll deal with Q&A after the moderated conversation, but there is just one comment in there already. Just um, So yes, this conversation is being recorded and will be available at a later date. Okay, so Carrie, can you please um, begin by telling us about your personal relationship to this mask um, and what it means to your family and when you first saw it? Sure, I'll start with um, describing um, describing the first time I saw it, and it, the, this as the slide shows. Um, the first time I saw the mask was as as we see it there. That's me in 2012 in Dalam at the Museum of Ethnology, um, seeing the mask in person for the first time. Um, we had known that it was there for a long time. Um, and because I have, I, I do quite a bit of artwork for people in Germany, one of my, um, my friends there had arranged for me to, to visit the mask. Um, and I guess when you go into a museum and you look at all of the beautiful artifacts and things, generally, when you're there, or in my experiences in the past, I'm there thinking about um, the history, thinking about the beauty of it, um, thinking about the meaning of it. But it's different when it's your own history and it's your your own meaning. So it it really changed the way that I think about um, about that experience of being in a museum because. As you can see in the photographs that we've shown of this mask, and you can see here, it's displayed in, in um, behind a glass case. It has really, uh, really beautiful lighting. Um, and it's sort of carefully curated for, for that visual impact. Um, and so the first thing that I felt was sort of like a little of being a little bit overwhelmed by, um, and, and I think taken a bit emotionally by the moment of getting to, to meet an ancestor. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of power there. And, and at the same time, I was, I felt this, this sort of deep sadness that came from the the disconnection of it being behind glass. Um, being a carver, I know what, what a mask smells like. I know what it feels like. And not being able to reach out and touch it was, was I don't know if there's anything more visceral than, than that in my memory of, uh, of that moment of first seeing it because the first thing that I wanted to do was to reach out but you can't because it's behind glass for its protection. Um, 
<clears throat> but then I started thinking about, you know, what masks are for um, and how, what the meaning of them is and how in our cultural ways, we think of them as our ancestors. We don't think of them as an aesthetic piece that's meant to hang on a wall um, on display. They tell part of our story. We animate them through dance and we bring them out at very specific times. And when they're not out, we, as I mentioned earlier, the, the most recent generation of this mask is in our box of treasures. And what that means is it's wrapped in a blanket and it's put away, it's put to sleep. Um, when I was there at the museum, I saw a little video, actually it was at the Humboldt Forum, of, uh, of a cousin of mine who had been there before me. And he was drumming and singing to the masks that are, that are in the archive. Um, and it reminded me how, how that's, that's our way. We, we care for our masks like that. So before the mask gets put into the box of treasures, we sing it to sleep. Um, and when the time comes for, for it to be danced again for ceremony, we sing a different song to awaken it. Uh, and in the museum, with the beautiful display and the perfect lighting, um, another thought came to me and it was that this mask never gets to sleep. It's like um, in, in the open position, it's like it's in, uh, in a permanent state of insomnia. And so those were kind of the, the conflicted feelings that, uh, that came with that moment where I was so happy to be able to see that mask and to be close to it. And at the same time, I felt a deep sadness because I couldn't hold it. I couldn't smell it. I couldn't connect with it the way that it was intended to be. Thank so you. that's, that's, the, that's the, uh, that's the story of my first, uh, my first encounter with this work. And that was, yeah, 10 years ago now. Thank you. Okay, it's amazing how visceral and resonant it is, even though it's you know ten years ten years from uh, this moment. And and I think we'll we'll come back to um, to that moment um, again shortly in the conversation. Monica, I'll turn to you. Um, and I wonder. So we've got Kerry sort of explaining his response to seeing it in 2012. Can you fill us in on on the history of the mask? Um, up until that moment as to how it came to be in the museum's collection and uh, the museum's relationship to the mask. Yes, thank you so much, Kim. And thank you so much, Carrie, for sharing this thought so openly with us. I have to admit, the longer I'm working as a curator for anthropological objects, I, the more I feel overwhelmed by the responsibility in connection to the stakeholders. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it helps me a lot um, to have contact with people like, like you, thank you. Um, yes, I would like to tell you about the history of the mask as far as we know it or what we know about it. Um, the mask came into the collection through to the Norwegian sea sailor, Johann Adrian Jakobsen, who was commissioned by the Ethnological Museum in Berlin to travel the west coast of Canada and Alaska in the 1880s. In these more than two years, he sent nearly 7,000 objects to Berlin. I mean, he was really collecting as much as he could. The object, could I? Uh, yeah, that's not is the red slide. The objects that Jacobson sent to Berlin are only one example of collections that tell about the entangled and intertwined histories and about crucial issues in our museum's history. It tells of the greedy need of Europeans, especially in times of colonialism, to bring cultural objects of cultures worldwide into their museums and hence contribute to stereotyping. 
The next slide, please. Um, Jakobsen state from this journey includes diaries, uh, price lists, and a travel log that had been published in 1884. Uh, we have just uh, made a new translation of the Northwest Coast part. I refer to that later. Uh, and this travel log recounts Jakobsen experiences in each place he traveled and illustrates what was perceived as collectible from a European perspective in his time to present cultures in the museum. How First Nations wanted to see themselves represented is not reflected in Jakobsen's travel log. It shows the lack of respect collectors and anthropologists at this time had towards the cultures they met and where they got the objects now being shown in museums worldwide. As you can see, <clears throat> an image of the Nulis mask is printed in this travel log. You can see it on the right side, but he didn't mention it further. Anyway, when he was visiting Hope Island, he wrote that, and I quote, the people were not inclined to sell me their dance masks and that only due to the great persuasive skill of my interpreter, George Hunt, it was possible to buy ethnological objects. So he was well aware um, that a lot of the, of the people he met were not really inclined to give away their objects, but were forced, forced to. As Aaron Glass puts it, Jacobsen had rather an amateur approach to ethnology, and he wasn't accepted amongst the academics of this time. Not least, it was also the lack of ethnographic information accompanying his collections that locked him out of the scientific and museum establishments. Cultural anthropologists at this time professionalized and people like Franz Boas became active in the region. Uh, the next slide, please. The lack, lack of information of the collection brought to Berlin by Jakobsen was one of the reasons Boas started his investigations and collecting tours on Vancouver Island. So the first information about the meaning and the use of the Nulis mask came to our museum through Boas' description in his 1895 uh, publication, The Social Organization and Secret Societies of the Group Little Indian. And there you can see it here on the right hand side, he's describing um, that this uh, at the festivals, and he's referring to Bodlach, um, the masks that represent the ancestors of the clan and refer to its, its legend. He's also mentioning the name Nulis, and he's also uh, writing down uh, the lines of the song that is supposed to be connected to the, to the mask. So uh, after the Nulis mask was brought to Europe from British Columbia, it still had a lot ahead of it. During World War II, it was stored in a bunker in Berlin and then taken with about 30,000 further objects to the Soviet Union, to today's, to today's St. Petersburg. During the time when Germany was divided, these objects were located in Leipzig because Leipzig was in East Germany and East Germany was closely related to the Soviet Union. And in this time, uh, the mask and the other objects neither uh, had uh, been seen by the public. And in 1990, the mask came back to Berlin again. And then it was exhibited in Dahlem where Kerry saw it on display in 2012 and it will be on display from the opening of the Humboldt Forum in this year on. So that's the history as far as we can tell. Thank you, Monica. Um, Carrie, I'll go back to you um, and ask, once you, back, so we'll bring ourselves, bring the audience back to 2012 now, once you did view the mask um, for the first time in person, what were your hopes for it? What, what did you anticipate um, might occur or hope you might hope might occur? Um, I guess it was sort of shortly after um, 2012 was shortly after we'd had um, our, our Newman Potlatch in in 2010. Um, and 
And at that potlatch was the first time that I saw the, the mask actually on display um, dancing. And it was also um, the first time that I had made pieces for our family um, to be part of uh, a potlatch ceremony. So it was very sort of fresh in my mind what a mask is for. Um, I guess that's, that's kind of what led me to this idea of imagine those three generations of, of masks, the ones that I've described. And I think we might, if we click forward, have, have images of, uh, of the other ones. Um, so the, the one on the left is the one at the Museum of Anthropology and the one on the right is the one that I saw danced in 2010 at our, at our potlatch. And I, I kind of had this idea while I was right, right in the moment while I was there about seeing these three generations um, dance together. And so at the time I, I asked the, the curator, um, what, what would it take to, to arrange, um, to maybe bring that, the new lease mass home on, on loan so that we could, um, so that we could see these, these masks all together. And it was sort of one of those like far off ideas, but, um, and I hadn't, even had an opportunity to, to check in with my family to see if that was something that they would want to, to have occur. But that was, I guess, a, a vision or a dream. Uh, the response from the curator at the time uh, was, I'm very sorry, but this is an extremely valuable piece. So, um, so it's difficult to, to get insurance. For, for a loan of that sort. Um, and in addition to that, they explained that because of the conservation process that, um, that they believed the mass had gone through, uh, I would, we would never be able to hold it with our bare hands or wear it to our face because one of the um, processes that was used during that time, uh, during the time when these masks were collected were to treat them with um, poison. Um, and that, that thought of, of, of concert, conserving something out of care for its aesthetic um, really stuck with me because as I explained earlier, we think of these masks as our ancestors, not as inanimate objects. We, we know that they have a spirit inside of them. And it raised the question for me, what happens to the spirit of a thing if, if uh, in the process of saving the, the wood, the paint, uh, the bark and the, the skin that it's made from, you poison it. What happens to the spirit? Um, and it's something that's sort of resonated through um, through my life and through my artistic practice since. Because up until that point, I had I'd been taught um, that the trees are our ancestors and that I have to treat them with respect when I'm carving. Um, I had been taught that our masks are our ancestors and you have to treat them with respect when you're making them, when you're dancing them. Um, and that, that way of respect had been demonstrated through the ceremonies that I'd attended. Um, and, and I think that the, the idea of, of harm coming through an act that was intended to care for something, um, really got me thinking about what are the things that I make mean? Um, it, it, that, that moment led to the thinking that went into 
placing the witness blanket into the Canadian Museum for Human Rights um, and uh, creating an agreement with them that, uh, that acknowledges the rights of the blanket itself. Um, it's also informed the process of preserving and conserving the objects that are on the witness blanket. Um, and, and as I have gone through my career since well, over the last 10 years, um, it's changed the way that I think and feel about what I'm doing when I'm carving. Um, And I guess that's that's the one of one of the big questions um, that I have is is what is what what harm do we do? Even you know people say uh, no harm was intended often, um, and usually it's true. But I don't know that our intentions matter when it comes to the consequence of our actions. Um, I, I sometimes refer to to uh, to the example of if you step on someone's foot, you don't step back and tell them that you didn't mean to. You just say I'm sorry, and then you try not to step on their foot again as you walk around them. Um, I think that those kinds of things, that kind of thought, can be really helpful in. In informing how we how we move forward together, how we how we deal with with um, the actions that were taken in the past. Thank you. So, thinking about specifically um, the conservation of the mask, I'll turn to you, Monica, again, and wonder if you can tell us, maybe more specifically from the museum's point of view, how the mask was conserved in the past, and also how your conservation practices are changing or perhaps have changed um, up until this moment. Yes, I'm happy to do so. Um, unfortunately, I hadn't been in charge when um, Kerry had been there 2012. Uh, there was not a curate at this time. I would have loved to meet you already. Well, about conservation practices, um, former conservative uh, conservators in ethnological museums often had not enough experience and knowledge about the material used for the objects. And they didn't have contact internationally. So it changed a lot in the last years. And they are also aware of practices like I have seen it in Canada, for instance, in the MOA that um, it's always a negotiation between um, conservation processes and interests of First Nation stakeholders what to do. Um, but I know that, for instance, the treatment of objects like gut barkers or mo moccasins with porcupine quill, that was a real challenge for the, for the conservators um, because they just didn't know how to, to handle it. And one challenge you addressed it already, um, Carrie, uh, is that museums with organic objects in the collection are facing till today is the treatment of objects that have been contaminated due to the earlier widespread of pesticides. And it was a practice that was still common till the 1980s. It might not be in the case for the objects that had been brought to St. Petersburg and later on to Leipzig, so also for the Nullis mask neither, but we would have to carry out that we should do that, uh, chemical tests to know for sure. Um, because we don't, the only thing, if you could give me the next slide, um, the documentation sometimes was really poor. Here you see it, for instance, uh, just on the back of the index card for the Nullis mask, uh, a conservator from the 1990s wrote down that she was doing something with bee wax and something with cellulose. cellulose. Uh, but it doesn't refer that uh, they were using pesticides at this time, for sure not anymore. But it could be that they had been treated in St. Petersburg or in Leipzig, and that is something we don't know. So it's also a lack of documentation, I have to say. And furthermore, that was something we had discussed last week, Carrie and Kim, 
for Western museums, you can still say if the object has an inventory number, it is not supposed to be used anymore. It's defunctionalized. Even if the objects are not contaminated, many museums would not admit a use of the objects, also for reasons of insurance or because conservators refer to fragility of the objects, etc. In my opinion, it is contradictory that museum objects are only to be seen, and nothing else anymore. So there are other approaches, uh, for instance, in Denmark, where museum objects are used for ceremonies of the royal family. What I like are the approaches like, for instance, the Omista does that the, that the public can see the objects, but they still can be used in ceremonies. Or there is a, an example of the Museo do Mare in Rio de Janeiro, uh, which is a neighborhood museum. And the people bring in their objects, but they, and then they are part of the museum, but they, if they like to, if they feel like it, they can always take it away. So it's a kind of, fluent thing. It's of course a lot more complicated if you are part of a huge German federal museum where you as a curator are not the only one to decide. But anyway, um, I'm really hoping that after this meeting there we will have more follow-ups and think about what to do uh, in the future maybe together. Thank you, Monica. It's it's uh, absolutely fascinating to hear both your your perspective on the history of these uh, sort of institutional practices, but also the potential for where they may go. Um, so, Carrie, back to you. Maybe if we can think a bit more in the imaginary for a moment and, and sort of take out take ourselves out of the the logistics. Can you tell us, you know, had this mask not been taken to Europe? had it not ended up at the Museum of Ethnology in Berlin, what might its last hundred years have looked like? How might it have lived otherwise? Well, while, while we're imagining things, I think I just heard Monica say that, that there's a possibility that, that this particular mask hasn't been treated with poison. Um, and so, I'd be really, really interested in following up on that to, to find out, to, to test if that is the case, um, because it, if it's true, then, then it might make what I'm about to say um, more possible, not just over the last hundred years, but maybe um, for the future. So I, I think I, I should tell a little bit more of the story of what the mask represents. We sort of really briefly gave it at the introduction, but um, which we've referenced a couple of things so far. We've referenced um, that, it's the, that it's the ancestor mask um, uh, for, for my family. And in its introduction, it talked about um, Nulis vanquishing a sea's youth. And this mask that you're looking at is um, is a sea youth mask. And so this, the, I'll give you the, the annotated version of, of the story, but um, Nulis uh, had, had left the, the village um, and he was looking for a new place for his people and was paddling in his canoe and he had all of his sacred objects with him. And he came upon the, the river where the village was meant to be. And he decided to face down the sea youth. And the sea youth is, uh, is a, a two-headed serpent. So you see on either side of, uh, of the face in the middle, a serpent head, and then there's a face in the middle. And the, this symbolism of the sea youth is that it represents opposing sides of any situation. So um, good and evil, strength and weakness, um, love and hate. Um, and the face in the middle represents the space in between them. So when, when he, as he approached the sea youth, the, the legend goes that 
he drew upon the power of his of his ancestors and of his sacred objects and he transformed into a grizzly bear that's why on the new release mask there's the the grizzly bear at the top there um and using that power he vanquished the sea youth and turned it into a mask and the mask is one of our family crests um and it represents the power of being one with all things of of being able to occupy the space between um war and peace and draw from draw the best of both together uh and i'm just using that as one example but it's 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 about being able to to draw from both sides of something um, in a positive, positive way. So <clears throat> that mask has a connection to this mask that you're looking at. Now, if you click to the next slide, um, and I said that I, that the potlatch that we had in 2010 was the first time I carved a piece for our family. And here is um, my version of that Seas Youth mask. And, um, and uh, you see it here in the closed position. Um, and that's, that's me dancing, um, dancing the mask. Um, and, and I should, should tell a little story about what it feels like, because I think that's important. Um, on the day of the potlatch, it was raining really, really hard. And you can actually see a little bit of the evidence of that on the mask. Those, those sort of sparkly bits are, are not sparkles, that's water. Um, and when, when it came time for me to dance, I had repaired behind the dance screen and then I had to exit the big house and go around in the rain and come inside. And as I was being guided, because as you can see, there's not many places to look out. Um, the only thing I could hear was the rain and my breath. And when you think about that, when I think about that story of, of Nulis transforming or channeling the power of the grizzly bear, I really felt that in that moment of peace as I was about to go in and dance this mask because I felt like I was becoming the sea youth through, through the sound, through the feeling. Um, and as I came into the big house and you can click to the next slide um, and started to dance the mask, um, I was transformed uh, in, in that moment. So, to answer your question about what would it look like um, over the past hundred years is, I don't know how many potlatches we would have had, but that mask would have likely been in, in one of them. Um, I saw a question in the, the Q&A about, is it appropriate to save these things? Um, and I, and you, we know that there are three generations of it. So there does there is a, an end of life for a mask where, where you may want to replace it for, for various reasons. Um, but I think that when it comes to, to some totems, some masks, um, that they're made to go back into the earth. Um, we, we know this for totems, that when they fall, uh, we don't fix them. We don't stand them back up. Um, we make, they make way for the stories of the future. And so there's a bit of a there's a sort of humility about them being living that grants them the grace uh, to, to, to live a life with a natural end. Uh, so I guess I'm not sure whether the mask would still be around if, uh, if the if it had stayed in our family. Um, so just from like a, a connection to history perspective, I love that it is still here, uh, but I'm not the one who can say whether it should be or not. Um, it certainly leads to interesting conversations um, and beautiful dreams of having, uh, having these masks potentially come together in some way in the future. Um, but I think that, that the new lease mask that's in Berlin would have had much more rest. Um, it would have been able to fulfill its purpose, which is 
to tell the story of Nulis and of the Coquecum. Um, and, and, and as for, for what it would look like now, I, I don't think that I can answer that. Thank you. Um, that's it's very rich to sort of gain such specific insights to it and also um, to, I don't know, to imagine different different histories and and where those those would end up it's challenging um a great number of my beliefs <laughs> and i'm unlearning as i sit here in the moment um we're at the 50 minute mark so just we're gonna move into our sort of final phase of questions shortly and then we'll leave to the audience q a um monica i just wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to carrie or anything he said um if you'd like before we before i move into the next question did you have any thoughts or anything you wanted to respond to that Yes, the thought I have, um, having uh, quite often, uh, I think as white European people who had never been colonized, it's a something um, we we don't have a we we don't we can't feel this feeling that you have uh, that objects were taken away from you. I don't think that the most people here are having really close connection to objects, even if they are from their ancestors. Uh, so therefore, I think that's the problem with the Western museum concept um, that this idea of objects being being alive is something that wasn't common. And so if you challenge this now, um, you have of course to challenge the whole idea at least of cultural historic museums in this way. Anyway, I think museums could still be places to tell stories and to make them open for a broader public and um, especially also here because there are a lot of kind of sometimes friendly meant but prejudice about um, First Nation or uh, Native people in North America. So that is something we hope we can do that we can um, show not only we, but that we can show together uh, with stake, stakeholders and First Nation representatives um, how their culture is meant. And as you had been talking, Carrie, I thought um, this statement would be a lot more interesting than just showing the mask. You know what you mean? What I mean? So. Yeah. Thank you, Monica. Um, I'll, I'll sort of phrase this one as a, a kind of general observation or statement or question, and then I'll put it to each of you to perhaps um, answer um, as, it, as it suits you. Um, I wonder if we can kind of zoom out and look at it maybe from a little bit of a macro perspective. Um, I worked for a number of years in the UK. Monica, you're obviously in an institution in Germany. Carrie, you're here in what is now Canada. You work internationally um, with institutions around the world. I wonder, I, I'm wondering about comparisons um, that perhaps you've both experienced. Monica working from an institution in Germany with various First Nations here in Canada. Perhaps you also work with museums and institutions in Canada. Carrie, you with working with institutions in Germany. I'm wondering if we'd be having the same conversation if we had a curator with us who was joining us from perhaps Britain or a country that had a closer tie to the colonization and the process and practice by which this mass came to be where it is now. Um, so that's sort of a, a long winded way of saying, you know, do you have any specific insights on, on the kind of national or um, national specificity and how those have sort of played out? in your dealings or in your relationships with different institutions that you've worked with, perhaps also with this object, with this mask, but also in other projects and practices. Carrie? 
Um, I'm not sure. I, I definitely feel a difference. Um, and I don't know if that's, if, that's a, if, if that's real or if that's a perceived difference. Um, because I think that a, a lot of these conversations revolve around, around power um, and, and who had what power when. Uh, when I think about uh, Jakobsen and his travels through our territories and collections and read his words about how he went about collecting. Some of it was, as, um, as has been mentioned, purchasing. Um, but he also talks about taking things from gravesites. He also talks about trying to entice people to come back with him. Um, now, I, I think that that starts to shift my, my sort of perception that Germany um, or people from Germany were not uh, our colonizers. They, they, they weren't, but, they, but Jakobsen at that time certainly held an amount of, of power in his dealings with, uh, with my ancestors. I've also been involved in um, a podcast conversation about decolonizing collections with the Pitt Rivers Museum, um, where they're starting to take on these, these questions of, of what, what do objects mean um, and how as an institution, uh, can they do better? Can, how, how can they, how can a change in perspective um, lead to different relationships? Uh, I don't think that um, that sending all objects back to where they came from is necessarily uh, going to happen. And and I think that the decision about whether or not things should be returned rests with the community that they come from. Um, but it all starts with transforming relationships. And to do that, I think that there has to be a better understanding of the perspectives that come from the, the cultural perspectives that we've been talking about here around what do what does this particular mask mean? That opens up a different kind of conversation. Um, so now we're not talking about a possession. We're talking about an ancestor. Um, we're not talking about something that's of monetary value. We're something that's talking about something that's of cultural value. Um, and I think that that's sort of unpacking those conversations to get down to what, what are the meanings of these objects is kind of at the core of how to approach the conversation, regardless of how um, a culture, a country, an institution might initially enter into the conversation. Thank you. And Monica, I mean, Germany is obviously a country um, with extremely traumatic histories of its own. Um, can you share some insights with us as to a specific German perspective on how institutions approach culture and memory? Yes, and I just wanted to, to refer to because um, if I was misunderstood, I'm very sorry. I know, of course, and it's still going on that there are a lot of people here suffering from discrimination and they had been in history a lot. Um, so I'm sorry if I just expressed it in a wrong way. And I think that is also in close connection why Germany started in the public debate quite late to reflect about colonialism because um, Germany had been facing all the consequences of the atrocities of national socialism and there is a lot of there were a lot of um, developments of memory culture about this time, and they took it very serious, and they still do, at least the majority of people. And of course, also German partition in West and East Germany made a lot of people suffer very severely. 
So that was something that was um, very much in the focus of German memory culture in, since World War II. And so colonial times in Germany that lasted bit, officially between the 1880s and the end of World War I in 1919 mm, hadn't been in the focus so much. Um, it was, it is just now, I would say, especially the last 15 years that there's really a debate about it. And as I mentioned before, Germany had uh, colonial territories on the African continent, in the Pacific, and in Asia. And um, in the moment, the current debate here and the political efforts concentrate mostly on the collections coming from the firma, former German colonies. And as you know, anthropological museums in Europe had always been part of the colonial infrastructure and an important part, and they also shaped the image of a lot of cultures worldwide. And nowadays the anthropological museums, at least in Germany, are more or less the only visible remaining institutions of the colonial system, at least for the broad public. And politics, they tend to put questions about collections in the foreground, also not at least to await further demands from the former colonies for the acknowledgement of genocide or the payment of reparation. So I think that's, uh, on the one hand, it's very important um, that there is an emphasis on this now, but on the other hand, um, sometimes politicians tend to, yeah, to wait a little bit and to concentrate on the museums, uh, but colonialism weren't only anthropological museums, as we know. Thank you. Just checking where we're at with time. Um, I think we'll start, we'll start moving into our sort of conclusion. I wonder if Monica, you could, um, if I could stay with you for a moment and she could just tell us a little bit briefly as we, as we sort of wrap up um, or head into the Q&A about the museum's current work in terms of uh, decolonization and uh, repatriation um, beyond the masking question here, but, but your sort of work more broadly as an institution. Yeah, maybe you could go to the, to the next. Well, if decolonization requires a rethinking of relationships as well as changes in structural authority or process and procedures, I think we still have a long way to go. But there is a lot of effort in Germany in the moment with the development of institutions dealing also with um, aspects of restitution or how to deal uh, with sensitive objects and also binding guidelines that are referring to collections that had been acquired, as we call it here, in the context of injustice. It's always very complicated, also this um, the matter of translation. Some things that are right in German don't work in English and the other way around. Um, I think the experience with laws like NACPRA could be a role model in these cases because there is no law here uh, about up to now about how to deal with um, objects from anthropological museums. And in the last years, um, the museum repatriated sensitive objects and human remains to several communities worldwide. And here on the slide, you see the repatriation of objects to the Chugach Corporation in southwestern Alaska. And that were objects Carrie already referred to that Jacobson robbed from graves in the Chugach region. And when we had a visit of a Chugach delegation of elders in 2015, we identified these objects. And in 2018, uh, our foundation repatriated these objects. It was a long process since governments from the US and Germany had to be involved. 
And yeah, the other objects from the region remain up to now in our collections and they are now bound uh, part of a joint research. Um, we are trying now to digitize all the information available so that it, they are accessible also for the Chugach Corporation. And we are currently also develop a storytelling project uh, together that you lead to an exhibition presented in Alaska and in Berlin. And to coordinate all this transcultural or community project, we have also hired new colleagues uh, who kind of um, work into this process is due. Uh, so some of these uh, corporations will also be visible in the exhibitions in the Humboldt Forum. I know for, uh, for Canadian museums, community work with indigenous heritage is common practice, but uh, since not many community representatives of the collections live here, cooperation needs more time and funds. And so um, we are step by step, we are now uh, trying to get our archives accessible by digitizing them and we have uh, and the next that the steps always have to be also to transcribe them because a lot of the material is handwritten and in either in a Boer uh, handwriting or in an old German writing. And then we still have to translate it at least into English. So that um, is a process that is going on step by step, but sometimes it takes long and sometimes also for us, we would be happy if it would go on a little bit quicker. Thank you. Okay. I'll just go through those ones. I think, um, I think we'll move kind of into our, our final question, I guess, and then we'll open it to the audience because I know there's a few questions already in the Q&A. Carrie, um, what's next? What is next for the mask possibly? Uh, I guess I would, I would love to learn more about the um, about about the possibility of it being uh, perhaps not treated with those with that poison. I'd like to know if it were. I think this is one of the questions in the in the in the Q and A. Is there a way to remediate that so that it can be restored to its original purpose, uh, and and what would that look like, um, <clears throat> so that it could fulfill its uh, its purpose it could be used in the way that it was intended. Um, so I think what what's next for me is is to to continue the conversation with Monica, um, with the with the institution of the Museum of Ethnology, and maybe most importantly with my family to find out what they would like to see happen um, with this mask, because with regarding the question of uh, of repatriation and and what to do with with these objects um, or with these ancestors maybe I should say we we really have to take guidance from the people who are whose stories they tell the people who are uh, have familial ties to the to the objects um, so, so that's that's what's uh, what's next for me. I I look forward to um, to the next time I come to Germany, coming to visit uh, my ancestor again, uh, because it's been it's been 10, 10 years, and it's already um, the first visit has already resulted in so much transformation in my thinking. Um, so I think that that's a priority for me. Is, is to to come to uh, to the new home um, at the the relocated uh, museum um, and to continue this relationship that we've begun. Um, lastly, I think that my um, my my very next step is uh, is at the invitation of of Monica to to provide a critical response to some of the um, some of the writing in Jakobsen's journal as part of the uh, the new exhibit that's coming up. So I'm I'm very 
um, thankful for this conversation because it's brought up a lot of different things that I will put to good use in uh, in carrying out that uh, that task of writing. Thank you. And Monica, what what is next for you? Yeah, first, I'm really looking forward to if Carrie comes to Berlin in person again, and we really can meet with the mask and continue our discussion. And then, as he mentioned already, um, the mask will be displayed in the Humboldt Forum and in the exhibition Jakobsen's journey is the starting point that will be critically commented by First Nation representatives, um, like the travel log by Kerry and also uh, other people like, for instance, Nika Carlison from, uh, from the Heide Grey Museum or Corinne Hunt. And uh, there will also be other forms of critical commentation or counter narratives like work by Michael Yagulanas, the Haida artist who uh, creates an artwork for the exhibition, an eight square meter mural as a counter narrative to Jakobsen and his travel log kind of juxtaposing the 19th century Western view with an indigenous perspective. So that is something we are really looking forward. And I think there is a, a lot of spectrum of, of different critical comments so that the audience, the German audience also gets a feeling of uh, how representative of the First Nations think about collecting practices and um, the role of museums. Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to move us into the Q&A portion. First of all, I'd like to thank both of you, though, for how um, sensitively and honestly you've addressed all of the questions. It's been really generative um, for me, and I think from what I'm seeing in the audience comments already, um, for people who have joined us here, and hopefully for those who watch the recording again later. So thank you very much, both of you, for, for engaging with this um, subject and questions in the way that you have. I'm gonna stop my screen share. And so I appear to have a Q&A function, a chat in which there are cues, and then um, you also have the capacity to raise your virtual hand. So I'll try and toggle through this like a DJ and um, see in what way it is the best to answer these. Oh my goodness, there's quite a lot of questions. So there was two in the chat. Oh, also, if you also want to speak for yourself, by all means, feel free to type the word question in the chat and I'll, I'll try and call on you. Um, there, was, there was two that were perhaps quite brief questions, so I'll just throw those out there first. Um, there was one um, from Elroy White who asked, was the song and description of the dance recorded? Are either of you able to address that one? Um, I have, oh, sorry, Monica, you go no, first. No, 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 go ahead. Okay, I, I have the words uh, of the song transcribed in English um, as part of the information that was given to me by by Wedledy. Um, but I and I've heard the song, but I don't have a, a recording of it, and I'm not sure, Monica, if you do. If I'm not completely mistaken. Um... There had been recordings, you know, phonograph recordings on wax cylinders, but um, there, there had been uh, by Boas, um, the one he sent parts of it to Berlin, uh, but uh, the one of the Nullis mask and other ones, they had been lost due to war loss, probably. But I'll, I can figure that out uh, again, but that was what I was reading and I couldn't find uh, a hint in our database, but I could research that. And another, um, perhaps a quick one that you're able to answer, Monica, that I'll just put out there first. Um, do you know, is Jakobsen's work in English available? And if so, where uh, might Carla be able to find that? <laughs> Um, there is a translation of the travel log from 1977 by Erna Gunter, but it misses some things out and there's also, it's not the best translation. We did a new translation of the Northwest Coast, Coast part. 
and uh, that will be edited uh, with the opening of the exhibition and it will also be available open source because we will use it also like an ebook so this part uh, would be available but if somebody wants to write me i can uh, bring also type my uh, email address i will be happy to send a version right now oh great okay thank you um Okay, well, there you go. That's a great answer. Thank you very much, Monica. All right, I'm trying to toggle through. I'm wondering what's the most sensible way. Would you guys like me to um, have people answer their, ask their own questions verbally to you? Have a break from my um, voice or? Let, let maybe go back and forth between them so we get to some of the people who had questions okay. earlier. There, I'm scanning through. There seems to be quite a lot of interest in um, the concept of how the mask was preserved, how that um, was poisonous and <clears throat> how that potentially may be remedied. Um, so there seems to be a great deal of interest in that. I wonder if perhaps um, you can decide, um, Carrie, perhaps you wanna answer first. Um, can you just give a little bit more nuance as to um, what, what the nature of the chemical was um, and what processes may be able to um, be taken on now? I actually don't have, um, a, a an accurate answer. What, what I was told at the time was that it would have been treated with arsenic. Um, and I'm, I'm, I wouldn't know uh, any process for, for remedying that. Uh, but maybe, maybe Monica would have more information about the possibility of, of remediating uh, a mask if it were treated with arsenic. Do you, do you in your conservation know anything about that, Monica? As far as I understood my colleagues in conservation it can be complicated to get it out of the object but it is always uh, dependent how often how much what it was arsenic is one but they also used quicksilver lead whatever um, what a colleague told me today is that sometimes the objects were already coming also from the americas i don't think in this case but maybe in other cases uh, and also from uh, some um, African uh, regions were already coming to Berlin um, with pesticides because sometimes they had already there been treated. But I'm quite sure that the Jacobsen didn't do that. He might have mentioned it in his, his travel log. Um, so remediating is always dependent, uh, well, how far the poisoning was going and therefore as i said uh, we would have to we have a, uh, a laboratory within our museum foundation and we could take a small part and then they could make an interpretation and tell us what is in there how much is it and so on and so forth but i don't want to or I, I can't go so much into detail because I'm not a conservator or also not a somebody uh, who knows a lot about chemistry, but I will happily start to uh, start this process with this mask. Thank you. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, there are quite a few questions that pick up on this idea of objects and objecthood. Um, and I will attempt to, I'll read one of them out and hopefully it picks out the threads that, that sort of quite a number of people are sort of articulating around the ideas of objects. Um, Maureen asks in the Q&A, um, with the witness blanket, the pieces are not called objects, Carrie, because the, that of course objectifies them and then puts them in a category of possessions. Um, and instead they're called stories because that's their essence. So Carrie, can you perhaps expand on this and how this is relevant to the new lease mask, this idea of object? Yeah, I keep catching myself calling it an object and I've tried to refer to it as my ancestor. Um, I think that's a kind of at the heart of, of what, what, what might answer other questions about what, what an institution can do. If we stop thinking of things as possessions um, and we think of them as relationship, uh, then it 
trans, it, it sort of flips the conversation from rights, because uh, property comes with rights, into responsibility, uh, because relationships come with responsibility. So in, in the conversation about this mask, that's what I would like to see, um, is rather than thinking of it, of Nulis as an object, think of Nulis as, um, as an ancestor. And that, that we are now in, I mean, we invited Nulis into this conversation in our introduction um, and speaking to this mask, we are now in relationship with. If, if an institution were able to, to transform their thinking uh, from, from a catalog of numbers that relate to possessions uh, into to that more relational format where, where that's where we begin. Um, that's how we would learn about what, what, what's the right thing to do with each of these things, because sort of we follow the, the trail of breadcrumbs back through, uh, back through history to find out where it came from, how it was gathered, um, and, and hopefully connect back with the people or the families that, that these objects came from. And and carry out the the long work of of addressing them on on a sort of case by case basis, uh, and for me that would mean through hereditary channels. It's not um, banning council. It's not uh, large groups. It's through conversations like this. And I recognize that it is an enormous amount of work, um, but I think it's the kind of work that we have to be be ready to take on because. Uh, what we're talking about isn't isn't for us right here and right now. I mean, it it can certainly be partly for us, but what I'm concerned with is the future of my culture, what it means um, to be Kwakwakwak in the future, um, what it means for future generations, and, and and I'm kind of like taking up the words of of uh, of of Nulis, um, who who was thinking about this in the process of vanquishing the sea suit? Um, that that's what that's what I would like to see, and that's what when it comes to these conversations, I would like the result to be is is a is a change in perspective. Thank you. Um, there's two attendees with their hands up. Trisha, did you? still have a question that you'd like to ask or has it been addressed? Trisha's hand is now down. Carla, did you still have a question that you wanted to ask? Oh no, okay. <laughs> Carla, I can unmute you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess it's further into the question I posed in the Q&A about the differing values between mainstream society and indigenous people. Big decisions can be made about some of our sacred objects, our sacred items, not objects. <laughs> um, for example, here in Victoria, we have the totem pole in Beacon Hill Park. It was made by Mungo Martin, who is Kwakwakiwak, the city of Victoria wanted to preserve their pole, goes in contradiction of Kwakwakiwak practices. They were told this, no, you don't do that. They went ahead and did it anyway. They went and got my husband who was Coast Salish with no ties to Kwakwakiwak to actually just go ahead and do the work. He was in the Navy at the time. So he was actually seconded by the city of Victoria to undertake a restoration project that the Kwakwakiwak never supported. To me, that was a bad decision. I mean, the pole's still there, it was restored. My husband did what he was asked, but it didn't feel good. 
knowing that you're violating your the, the people, the traditions, the teachings, you know, but you have to maintain. So that's why I'm worried about reconciling values because we make these huge ginormous decisions. And to me, it's often based on a lopsided view of the value. So are we getting any closer towards recon reconciling the value that there is in art? Because I really appreciate that, you know, the, the beauty of it all. Our people work very hard for some of these items. They were never meant to be sitting on the wall, though, the way that Carrie talked about earlier. They were never meant to be that way. So I'm just worried about, again, the reconciling of these two values. Are we getting closer to having uh, a clearer understanding? Can we make better decisions over these items, these, these sacred items? than we do already. Thank you, Carla. Carrie, would you like to address Carla's question? Well, I, I, I'm really interested to hear what Monica has to say about this because I, I know in my own relationships what um, with like the Canadian Museum for Human Rights has been. And I also know how my relationship with, with Monica has begun. And I think that, that it points to, yes, a, a change in tide, but um, being that, Monica, you work in this area um, on an everyday basis, uh, uh, I, I'm curious to know how, how that is, is that, how, how you would address that question. Hmm. I think it's complicated for me uh, really to answer. Uh, I'm... <laughs> Yeah, I always wonder if objects that were made for a certain purpose uh, that was clearly not a, a museum context, um, if they should be somewhere else anyway. Um, but what I wonder also, and so I give the question also back to you, Carrie. What do you think about, about objects that were made from the beginning um, to be shown or to be on display or to be not in the original cultural context? Um, I, I struggle with that. Um, and I sort of the decision I've come to is that I can only be, I can only speak for myself because I don't want to speak for, uh, for other artists. Mm. Um, I, I've made the decision that when I make a mask, that it will be for ceremony, that it's not, that I don't make them anymore for, for commercial sale. Uh, because of the things that have, have sort of, come through this kind of conversation, come through my, my changed understanding of the new lease mask. Um, so, but that's a personal choice that, that I make. Um, and I think that there's maybe a distinction to be made between one that tells the history of a family like this one does, where it's very specific in the, it being a transformation and tells, illustrates a very particular thing from a mask of say, uh, a bear or an eagle or a uh, salmon or an orca where maybe there's a version of it that tells a specific story but it's more of a depiction um, which I know that that many artists do and I would never want to to take away that that livelihood for them um, to take away their right to um to to make a living from from their skills from their culture uh as for the question that i saw in the the chat about whether or not what what the responsibility around a museum is for for collecting current objects um that are made in this way again i would refer back to the community um it's i, I think that that museums serve an important role in in sharing, uh, in, sh in, in the, in sharing culture and, and having 
building understanding between people. Uh, and I know we're almost out of time, but with that comes responsibility. And I saw noted um, by Tara, the question about um, the way that some things are valued differently and how that has a cascading effect um, upon art, the artists of today, the cultures of today, because there's been a hierarchy created by uh, Northwest Coast totems being valued in a certain way. I think that we have to start valuing all of them in the same way so that we're not participating in the furthering of, uh, of inequity, of, of ranking different cultures based on, based on, uh, on a perceived value of, uh, of a particular aesthetic. Thank you. All right, I'll just ask everyone just to stay with us for one more moment. I just have an important slide that Carrie would like us to end on. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to everyone's um, questions in the Q&A and in the chat. Um, it's wonderful to see how generative the conversation is and that these questions are being asked. I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to all of them. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank um, both of our speakers for their generosity, uh, their vulnerability and their time to address this important topic. Um, thank you to uh, Marcus and Alana and the department for hosting us and enabling this conversation to happen. And most of all, thank you to all of you for joining us so that we could um, have this conversation, have your responses and, and see where these um, ideas can generate further. Uh, so uh, thank you all. And um, Carrie, did you, did you wanna close on anything to? Uh, I wanna express my gratitude to you, Kim, for facilitating okay. such a wonderful conversation. And thank you, Monica, for taking the time and being up so late. I know um, <laughs> it's past, it'd be past my bedtime if I was in Germany. Um, <laughs> and again, thank everybody for, for all of the questions. I'm gonna, if, if it's possible, I'm gonna, try to um, to download all of the questions that are in the in the chat um, so that if I know you um, I can try to answer them offline but wonderful uh, with gratitude all right yeah. and Monica Same. Thanks so thanks so much to everybody too and um, yeah if whoever would like to approach also to uh, come to, to me, I sent my email address or otherwise you, uh, Carrie could give it to you and I will be happy to answer the questions as well as, as far as I can. And thank you, Carrie and Kim for having me and also leading this conversation. Wonderful, thank you both. So that concludes our uh, conversation today. Thank you again for coming and uh, have a good day, everyone.